Chris Monroe. Chris is the Beachy Zorn Professor at the Joint Quantum Institute and the University of Maryland, uh, and is a professor of, of physics. And what I like uh, best about his, uh, his website was he has his academic family tree on there. And it goes back to uh, Magnus, Magnus Force Magnus, and, uh, and Weiss, which is uh, molecular field theory Weiss. But what's amazing, I'll just mention the, the recent history. James Frank, Wolfgang Paul, Theodore Hench, and I'm skipping people, uh, Carl Weinman, all Nobel Prize winners. And his thesis, he did his thesis with Carl Weinman, and he did his postdoc with David Weinland at NIST. So quite a high, high bar there. And, uh, and uh, he, he was at NIST for about, he, he got his PhD in 1994, and, and then spent uh, some time at NIST before going on to um, be a professor at the University of Michigan. And he's been in Maryland for about six years doing really amazing things with ion trap physics. And he's going to tell, you, tell us about some of that work today and how uh, quantum networking. <laughs> oh, there's the subway to be Yes, the vibration <laughs> side. Right there. Yeah. Yeah. Don't be, how far is it? It's on the other side of the wall. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And, and the rumor, ha rumor has it, it's where BCS was written. Oh, where, where the wave function was written. Yeah. <laughs> they had to jar their, jar their minds into, into writing that down. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Andy, and, and the invitation. Uh, it's my first time here. Uh, of course, I've known the department, the department for many years, including Paul Berman, who's a very close friend of mine in Michigan, and still remain, remains, uh, remains close. Uh, okay, I will, before I get into this, uh, there are some questions about this, this painting. It's, uh, it, it, it's a square painting about, about yay big, it sits in my home office. Uh, my wife won't let me put it in any other room, she doesn't like it that much, but it, it was painted by a former postdoc of mine, Boris Blinoff, who is a faculty member in Washington, University of Washington, Seattle. And when he was a postdoc, we were playing around with atoms of cadmium, cadmium ions. And uh, if you know anything about oil paints, the yellow paint, the bright yellow paint you get, it's called cadmium yellow. So these are two cadmium atoms entangled. And so this is the entanglement. And, and hopefully uh, I'll talk a little bit about what that means and, and in different contexts. All under the guise of, um, of quantum information science, what entanglement is useful for. Um, and so this, yes, this is a talk on quantum computing, quantum information. So. Uh, as a knob turner and experimentalist, I'll spend a good half of the talk on uh, uh, particular experiments, uh, a particular platform to realize these ideas. But I will also take the opportunity to be a little pedagogical at the beginning and maybe motivate the field. Many of you heard it from this perspective, maybe many of you haven't. Um, it's always a fun topic to talk about because we have this wonderful history of classical computing and a lot of what happened uh, 50, 80 years ago uh, we're seeing similar things happening in the quantum world from theory all the way to experiment and hopefully you'll see what I mean. So um, at this institute at, uh, down uh, just inside the Beltway outside of Washington, um, we have a, an institute that is shared between the university and NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology called the Joint Quantum Institute. And we exist basically to promote the idea that there, there's, there seems to be a juxtaposition of these two very well-known pillars of 20th century, uh, 20th century thought, quantum mechanics, uh, maybe a little more narrow uh, within the physics world, but also information theory. And that they should be linked, is, maybe that was an obvious thing 100 years ago, but the, the quantum measurement problem, entanglement, it all comes down to information. And uh, in, in, in combining these two topics, this, this field of quantum information science has emerged only in the last few decades. And uh, it gives us potential opportunities to do some really neat things. And I hope to maybe motivate you, mo motivate some of those things to you here, uh, and also tell you a little bit about some of the exotic hardware that we'll need to actually make it. So quantum mechanics and information theory. Well, so there's Moore's Law. Everybody knows what Moore's Law is. Uh, the, uh, and, and here uh, is, is Moore's Law depicted in a log linear plot of the number of transistors on a given chip versus year, log linear here, so this is exponential growth. 
And these are all the Intel processors throughout the years. Um, and, and you can see that uh, it's a little outdated now. We're at, we're at about a level of 10 billion transistors on, on a square inch or something like that. Um, and well, th this growth was, of course, instrumental to, to the economy of the, of the world in the last 40, 50 years. Uh, the, 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 the shrinking of computers, uh, the, their ability to be used to design aircraft, and just all, countless numbers of applications of those. And the reason I put this plot up here is that this, this growth will not continue forever. And many of you know this. Uh, in physics, we know that matter is granular. And if you keep, if you keep shoving transistors into the same space, um, you're going to run out of space. And if you extrapolate according to whatever exponent you want to pick here, by the year 2025, each transistor, if you do the math here, each transistor will be so small that it will be about the size of a molecule. And if you wait a few more years after that, each transistor will be the size of a hydrogen atom. Okay, so it's pretty clear that we're not going to be able to enjoy that growth there. And it, even if we do, it's pretty much going to stop at that point. Okay. And you can't simply make the system bigger because there's a connectivity problem and there's a heat problem. Uh, uh, if, you've, if, 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 you would, if you've seen any of these processes, they're all about the same size, and that's for a good reason. It turns out you really can only uh, grow by making things smaller. You, can, uh, you have to increase the transistor density. Do you have a question? Well, that's planar. Right. This is planar. There's multi-level. Okay, that's there's a factor of three or something. I mean, th th those aren't huge gains. Well, but I mean, one could imagine instead of making out, you know, a quantum computer, you can make a, a volume computer. Well, this is not anything about quantum. There's right. nothing quantum here. Yeah, but the motivation is we need something else because transistors are going to run out. But ten years ago, someone would have come, and put up the same graph and drawn the same line and said things are going to run out. You know, yeah. and then they also had other problems, you know, at, at that time was you're not going to break the, the wavelength of light, you know. People have been saying we're going to hit this wall for a long time. Right? Oh, but that, yeah, I would say that wavelength of light thing is a technical thing. This is fundamental. If you want to build in 3D, you have to wire them up. How are you going to wire them up? The wires have to come somewhere. And so far, the wires have been coming through vias in the third dimension. You can make multi-layer structures. But even if you make 3D, okay, maybe you can get another 10 years out of this. But, it, you know, anticipation is really the issue. Yeah, right now it's about getting the heat out. I mean, you have real conductors and so forth. And you know, there's a whole topic here on why uh, if you get rid of dissipation, you're going to be forced to confront quantum mechanics. But this is a very fundamental thing. Matter is granular, period. You won't be able to shrink things indefinitely, no matter what. Okay. So um, when, we, when we think of the birth of Moore's Law and these processors, it's also fun. Uh, as an experimentalist, I'm always thinking about hardware. These early computers, you've seen these very famous pictures. This, this is the ENIAC computer vacuum tubes, 5,000 vacuum tubes in this thing. Pretty exotic hardware. You had, I mean, there, these vacuum tubes broke all the time. There was a guy who had a full-time job of just replacing vacuum tubes here. And shortly after that, this is, this is the solid state transistor, which looks equally nasty. And it was. This, this junction here, uh, I think that's germanium there, and it has to have just the, right, just the right amount of water on there to make the contact work like a perfect diode. You can see that the tension of, of uh, the, this little spring uh, 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 on that junction has to be controlled. I mean, this is, this, this is not reliable, and you can't imagine with that technology scaling up to 10 billion transistors on a square inch. So there had to be a lot of engineering to be done to make that work, of course. Um, so what does this have to do with quantum mechanics? So now let me turn it around. Well, we would love to have growth along a, some type of a Moore's Law. And one way to do this is to change the rules in which we can process information. And uh, this is a very famous quotation of Richard Feynman uh, in one of his APS uh, talks a long time ago. And this, I would say this is a lecture on nanotechnology before that word even existed. And he talks about, I think he was, he was motivated by this picture here, a solid state transistor. And solids, you can miniaturize down to an individual atomic scale if you want. And he imagined what would happen if you did that. And he said, well, when you do this, we should be able to still have transistors, no problem. But there's something new, and that is when you get to the small scale of individual atomic circuits, there are new opportunities for design. And it's because of quantum mechanics. Because at that simple level of few degrees of freedom, there are new laws of physics that are really coming into play here. Now, new isn't exactly the right way to say it, but let's face it, quantum mechanics doesn't really play a role in uh, classical, in, in, in the uh, 
everyday life, really whatsoever. In fact, you can understand how this transistor works, or at least you can be comfortable with how this works without knowing anything about quantum mechanics. Right? It's a spin-dependent switch, or sorry, a current-dependent, a current-dependent voltage. Think about it that way. You don't really need quantum mechanics for that. But Feynman promoted the idea that, well, if we're going to make things small, let's let's try to see if we can take advantage of quantum mechanics and do something new. Okay. So unfortunately, in 1959, he didn't have he didn't know what that opportunity was, and it took another 30 years or so before that opportunity presented itself. And this is the field of quantum information science. And and again, I'm not going to since I only have limited time. I can't define the field entirely and exactly what makes it work and all the applications. I just want to give you a general uh, uh, kind of a taste of what it means. What you do, what, what you can do when you, when you store information in quantum systems instead of discrete bits, zeros and ones. Okay, so I think of it as a good news, bad news, good news story. So let's start with bits. Classical bits are zero or one. Well, quantum bits, if the, if the two levels are a quantum system, they can be stored in superposition. We can have zero and one at the same time. And so the good news is that when you put lots of these bits together, uh, you get explosive growth. In fact, exponential growth. You all know that if you have n bits, there are two to the n numbers you can represent. If you have n quantum bits, you can store a superposition of two to the n numbers. So this is, this is fantastic. It's exponential growth in storage capacity. So now Moore's law is not doubling of the transistor density every few years, it's add one bit, you just double the system. Add one bit, you just double the system. Okay, so wouldn't it be great if we could live by that law? Well, here's a cartoon to denote a quantum computer. <laughs> okay, unfortunately we're left to cartoons at this point, maybe not in the, in the future, but here we have three bits, eight numbers, and these A coefficients are continuous amplitudes, they evolve according to a wave equation, doesn't matter so much, there's math behind it, but they're all stored at the same time. And here we're going to compute a function of three bits of input, and we're going to, com we're going to produce three bits of output in superposition. And so these grayscales sort of denote the weightings of each of these, and the magnitude squared of the amplitudes. Okay, so this is great, we have parallel processing. It's a, it's a multi-core processor with only one core. So we turn the crank once, and we get to compute the, the function of all the inputs at the same time. And this is amazing. I mean, it's exponential growth in a way. It's exponential speed up. Well, with, with three qubits, you know, eight's not such a big number. But if you have 300 qubits, quantum bits, qubits, if you take 300 electrons or 300 photons, 300 quantum two-level systems, that's a pretty small chunk of matter. But two to the 300 is huge. And by merely having that small chunk of matter, if you had complete quantum control of that small chunk of matter, you would have the capability of storing and processing more information than would, than would ever be possible for all time, because that's more than the number of particles in the entire universe. Okay, so I'm being I'm I'm I'm, I'm overhyping things because this is good news. There's bad news coming. Okay, and and so so this good news is again the exponential possibility of storing things here. The bad news, of course, is that we all know in quantum mechanics. There's another rule. Not only do you get to have superpositions that evolve according to a wave equation. You have this measurement problem, where when you measure a superposition, you only get one answer. And worse still, you don't know what answer you're going to get ahead of time. There's, rent, there's, there's noise, inherent noise. So if we go ahead and do this a three bit uh, processor, when we make a measurement, we only get one answer. And we don't know what the answer stemmed from. So we're sort of worse off than we started. We have no idea what that answer means. We'd have to invert that function and find out what the input must have been. Okay. So this is really bad news. In fact, I'm sure Feynman uh, never thought much about this good news because he realized that it's very hard to access that exponential amount of information. Okay. So this is where things stood for those 30 years in the late 20th century until David Deutsch came along in the mid-80s and others, I think Feynman sort of really uh, promoted this idea. So did people like Charlie Bennett up the road at IBM uh, Paul Benioff uh, at Boston University, many kind of fringe quantum mechanics uh, thought about how you might be able to uh, uh, use qubits to compute, do something interesting. And David Deutsch really put it together. The idea is there's a final piece of good news here, and that is before you measure, you allow these, these qubits, this is hard, very hard to draw, very hard to depict, 
Uh, but you allow these amplitudes um, of all these input states to interfere because they follow a wave equation. And quantum mechanics allows interference. You can have uh, qubits interfere so that ones and zeros uh, appear or they disappear and so forth. Now these blue dots are supposed to denote gates uh, and they're akin to classical gates of transistors wiring together. Here we're wiring together amplitudes. We're, we're, we're punching these quantum systems so that they interfere in certain ways. We're not making a measurement. We're allowing them to interfere. And there are some problems that can be encoded such that you may have two to the 300 inputs, but the interference is so complete that you only get one output or a few outputs. And most of the others cancel. And now when you make a measurement, there's no more random, there's very little randomness. And there are certain applications where this measurement, the information contained in this output can, can depend on something about all those uh, inputs. And there may be two to the 300 of those inputs, okay? So this is basically a quantum computer, and I've unfortunately been very vague, so I'm not telling you what the application is. Not many applications can be cast in this form, but there are a few. The biggest one, I would say, is, is the one of Peter Shore, who showed in 1994 that, uh, that, that if you were to build a quantum computer, you could factor numbers fast. In fact, exponentially faster than any known classical algorithm. So factoring numbers is known to be a hard problem classically uh, for small numbers is pretty easy. 15, it's easy to know that it's 5 times 3, but yes. I thought it wasn't known, but no one has succeeded in coming up with a fast number. Yeah, yeah, okay. I should be a little more specific there. Um, um, it's not known that factoring is an NP hard problem, uh, but there, uh, as far as we all know, maybe, maybe in the NSA basement there's somebody, had, somebody has an easy factoring algorithm, but it's not known. There, there is no known fast algorithm, put it that way. Yeah, that's a weaker statement. Uh, yes? Can I ask, is the good news that there's one input or a small number, which are uh, that probabilists, which have that simple probability? Yeah, in, in, in fact, it will be a small number. But the point is, it's not nearly as complex as this. Right. Eight's easy. But if this were 2 to the 300, here you might have only 300. Right. And by doing the experiment 300 times, you can you can get a distribution of all the answers. Not and that, times, many. Yeah, like several hundred times. Several. But not, yeah. not several right, times two to three hundred. Yeah. So so they're still they they're still characterized by a probability distribution. Yeah. 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 You just showed a place where that probability distribution happens to be yeah, this one is, and zero. This is the ideal. Yeah, yeah. But the good news is this vast reduction. Yes. And in the end, you'll find that all these algorithms have something in common, and that is what you're measuring is some global property of the inputs. And in fact, for the Shor's algorithm, it turns out to be the periodicity. When you take a Fourier transform of a comp complex signal, and you have a, and you have a monochromatic uh, output, that's one answer, one frequency. But the input signal is actually has lots of inputs. Okay? That's one kind of example. Okay, okay. again, I, 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 I could go on uh, at length here, but I want to I want to specialize to to the laboratory where we would like to not only identify good quantum bits where, where um, measurement doesn't happen unless we want it to happen. That's, that's actually very tricky. If you want to do this processing, you better not measure. You better not make it possible that anybody measures. You better not let air hit this thing. I mean, you have to have almost complete isolation, and that's really tricky. So we want to identify these qubits, uh, um, uh, not only measure them out at the end, but also do these gates, these quantum gates that allow interferences to happen. And so let me talk about these gates. Quantum gates. Well, this is kind of fun because, again, we can resort to our, our, uh, our knowledge of classical computing. And many of you know that classical computers can be built out of uh, a finite family of, of, of uh, classical gates like the NAND gate. If you can operate a NAND gate on any pair of classical bits, you can do everything. It's a universal gate. Okay. And NAND is good because when you cascade two transistors, you naturally get a NAND. It's sort of an easy circuit to build. Well, quantum mechanics, quantum computing has the same type of universal family. Now, let's start with the single bit gates. Now, classically, there's only, there are only two things you can do to a single bit. You can either leave it alone or flip it. That's a NOT gate. Well, quantum mechanics, you can do more things. You can flip it halfway. You can make superpositions. Okay. So here's an example of an interesting gate called called a square root of naught gate, which makes no sense classically. This is the gate which, when applied twice, will flip the bit. 
I just said classically, you can either leave the, gate, the bit alone or flip it. Whatever you do classically, if you do it twice, you've returned to home. You've returned to where you started. Right? If you flip it twice, you come back. So the square root of not makes no sense classically. You can't uh, have a gate when applied twice gives you a not gate. But quantum mechanically, you can. Here's an example. Zero goes into zero plus one. And for those of you that haven't had quantum mechanics yet, this just means superposition of zero and one. And one goes to one minus zero. And this minus sign is there because uh, we need the two outputs to be um, distinct. If you have two different inputs arriving to the same output, uh, quantum mechanics doesn't allow that. Quantum mechanics is reversible. So by putting that minus sign instead of the plus sign, it makes it reversible. And you can do this in your head. If you do this twice, zero becomes one and one becomes zero. Well, it becomes minus zero, but it doesn't matter. Okay. Um, so there's the square root of not being. More interesting are the two qubit or higher qubit gates, and Taiku did some work on this in the early days in the 90s on, we were just talking about um, uh, 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 realizing two qubit gates and, and uh, his work with Charlie Bennett and others, uh, and Harold Weinfeld or uh, Innsbruck, uh, actually played, played, played a pretty big part into motivating experimentalists to start making these gates in the lab, such as me, Dave Weinland over at NIST. Here's a two qubit gate. We have two inputs. Uh, these are the four possibilities of two inputs. And all I'm doing here is flipping the second bit if and only if the first bit is one. That's called a control not gate or a quantum exclusive or. It's a classical truth table, right? I'm, I'm just doing this prescription here. But it's quantum because it works for quantum states. It works for superposition. And here we get something really interesting. If you start out, concentrate on this input state. If we start out with two qubits, blue and red. The blue one has been put in a superposition. We did one of these guys on it. We did a root not gate on the blue one. So we have that superposition. And the red, uh, the red qubit is in the state 0. Now if we take that state and, uh, and operate on those two qubits with this quantum XOR gate, um, you can see 0, 0 becomes zero, remains 0, 0. But 1, 0 becomes 1, 1. So we end up with this superposition here. We go from that to that. And this is a really big step. And the reason it's really big is that this state has a special property called entanglement. Entanglement means the quantum state cannot be written as a product of the blue one and the red one. This one is a product state. There's the blue one. There's the red one. It's a direct product of the two uh, spaces of the, of the qubits. They're not really connected. They're independent. Here, you can see uh, the word entanglement's a good one. It means they're, upon measurement, they will always be correlated in some way. Remember, quantum measurement randomly picks of the many possibilities. In this case, if we measure these two qubits, we will always get 0, 0, or 1, 1. We never get the other ones. We never get the mixed states, 0, 1, 1, 0. So this correlation is perfect if you have a perfectly prepared state like this. Yet, yet the qubits don't have to be next to each other. They could be really far apart. Who's to say? At, at some point, they have to interact. Okay, Maybe they have to be close. They probably, in practice, have to be close together at some point. But they could be taken on opposite sides of the universe or the solar system. And now, if I have the blue one here on Earth, and you have the red one on Jupiter, and I measure mine, I measure a zero, I know immediately that you have a zero. In fact, I know that you have a zero in a time faster than the speed of light could make the distance between us. So states like this um, are very weird. In fact, uh, Einstein, Kolosky, and Rosen wrote a very famous paper, EPR, in 1935, where he pointed out that quantum mechanics is just ridiculous because of states like this. How could you admit states like this that have some kind of non-local character to them? And the resolution of this so-called EPR paradox has to do with information theory, which wasn't yet developed in 1935. It turns out, if you think about this, if we prepare many such pairs, so I have the blue and you have the red, and we have many such pairs identical. I measure mine, I get zero, you get zero. I measure mine, I get zero, you get zero. The next one I measure one, I know you have one. I measure zero, you have zero. There's no information transfer in establishing those correlated random bits. They're random bits. Just because you have the same random bits that I do means nothing. You cannot use that to encode information. So 
Entanglement does not imply information transferred faster than light. And because information was not uh, quantified in terms of entropy and so forth, um, it, this, this remains sort of, I mean, it's still an interesting thing, but it's not really a paradox. There's no information transfer and everything's okay. And it turns out Einstein really was wrong. Quantum mechanics is not local. And if you do have a replacement of quantum mechanics that's a, a cleaner extension of it, it will also be non-local. This is very well established now. Anyway, entanglement is sort of that stuff in my first slide between the cadmium atoms. It's, it's a weird connection between qubits. It's a connection without a connection, without any wires. And the way I look at it, this is what quantum computers do. They have qubits that can be wired together without real hardware. Now you have to entangle them to begin with, and that will involve associated hardware. But once they're set, you can enjoy interconnects that would be entirely impossible in any classical system. Okay? And that's it for the pedagogy. I want to move on to experiments. Yes? And so we can only use it once. Uh, yeah. Um, you, um, well, in, in this sort of generic cartoon of a quantum computer, these logic gates make entanglement. And the point is, there better not be 2 to the 300 logic gates. That's, you can't do 10 to the 90 operations. That's much too slow. But you may have uh, a program where you only have to do 300 operations. And the entanglement that you generate can be really complicated. And then in the end, when you measure it, yeah, you can only measure it once. And then you may have to repeat it a few times. And as we heard earlier, you don't want to have to repeat it 10 to the 90th times. So you're sort of constrained. But there are problems that can take advantage of that exponential storage capacity. And having a finite and a small number, relatively small number of gates that entangle, the entanglement sort of uh, sets up these correlations. And when you measure one qubit, you're going to measure lots of qubits, right? We have lots of measurements here, lots of, lots of qubits involved here. When you measure one qubit, it's sort of all the others sort of fall in the line. When you make that measurement, then you measure the next one, they fall, some of the others fall in the line. So every time you measure one qubit, you're sort of uh, resolving a lot of these connections. That's one way to think about it. <laughs> okay, well, let's move on. So we want to build one of these things. And if you want to look into high tech and build something like this, you consult Tom Clancy, of course. And well, in, in one of his books, so, so Tom Clancy's books are kind of goofy, but he really dives into uh, kind of modern technology. And in this one, in this book, one of his, one of his guys, uh, they're playing cards, and he says, oh, it's too bad the, what we're doing now is not like quantum computing, where you can find ions in electric fields and, and zap them with laser beams. This is exactly what we do in my lab and a few labs in the world where we have one of the most pristine quantum systems uh, known. And here it is. This is a collection of about 15 atoms. You can see each one. They're in a, they're in a linear crystal. And they're confined in a vacuum chamber. Uh, they're confined with electric fields. So they're levitating in free space. There's nothing else there. So this, you might argue this is the simplest solid you could imagine. The lattice spacing is given by uh, an external confinement force. So think of a bowl. These, these, these are atomic ions. They repel each other, but they're all confined in a bowl. And the bowl is clearly very weak in one direction. The other two directions are just like a cigar potential, like a canoe or something. The other two directions are confined very tightly, and one direction is very weak. So the ions naturally line themselves in a, in a straight line. They're not even uniformly spaced. You'll notice the ones in the middle are a little closer. That's OK, but they're, it's stable, and you know, we, we can measure these things. Now, you're seeing these atoms because we're shining laser light in this chamber. Um, we know what the atom is. We know what laser wavelength to tune. Um, ytterbium ions, it turns out, if you look at the periodic table, ytterbium is in the lower right-hand corner. It's very heavy. But it has two outer electrons, so it's a little like helium. When you ionize it, it only has one outer electron. So now it's like hydrogen. It's a simple atom. It just has one outer electron. And it's very special because when we shine laser, radiation at a particular wavelength that I can tell you to about 12 digits. We have to get lasers just right at the right wavelength. This atom will be excited to an excited state and it will radiate back to where it started and it'll do it again. It'll radiate, one atom will radiate about a billion photons per second. One atom. That's why you can see these. This is not normal matter. Normal matter doesn't scatter light nearly that efficiently. You can see these atoms with your naked eye. If you can see in the ultraviolet, these are this is uh, this wavelength is, is uh, shorter than 0.4 microns, barely what you can see. 
But with a simple microscope objective here, we can image these atoms onto a TV screen and easily see them from the background. There is no pattern. That's, that, that, that's why this works. Okay? So right now, these aren't very good qubits because we're measuring them. Um, and I, I, I point out there are many groups in the world looking at this physical platform. And 20 years ago, there was only one. And it was uh, the group of, with David Weinland that I was lucky to be part of in the 90s. And since then, lots of young groups have, have gotten into the action, mainly because this is the most clean quantum system that you can imagine uh, building a quantum information processor with. It's sort of a bottom-up approach, though. It comes in limited supply. And I want to talk to you about how we can network to build bigger systems. Okay. All right, anything else I want to say? You can see the atoms are separated by, oh, that should be, oh, I'm sorry, that should be microns. No, I was oh, wondering about that. I was confused. <laughs> right. okay. Are you controlling the separation, or are they being just, uh, is it the interactions that set the, the interact the, well, These are identical mass and charge ions. So you can calculate exactly what should happen. So it's Coulomb forces. That yeah, Coulomb forces. forces. Okay. Well, I'm really sorry about that. The, 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 uh, <laughs> the resolution of our optics is about two microns, yeah. one micron. It's diffraction limited. The atoms are laser cooled. And in fact, they occupy a space of about 10 nanometers. We can't, we can't uh, resolve that. So each atom is actually much smaller than these blobs. But we don't really care about that. We're not imaging the electron or anything. All we care is that we can, ice, we can uh, resolve each atom from its neighbor. Okay. Yeah, five microns, sorry. So um, all right, so there's the platform. Let me dive into a little bit of atomic physics. I think I mentioned this a little bit, that determining is a particularly simple atom. If you've studied hydrogen, and I, I know most of you have, um, the quantum numbers are identical to hydrogen, and the reason is, this particular isotope has a spin one half nucleus, so uh, the, there's a there, there's a quartet of levels in the S ground state. Electrons spin one half, the nucleus is spin one half, so there are four levels, and um, they're coupled by a hyperfine interaction. That's the spin spin interaction, the magnetic interaction between that electron and that nucleus, and the hyperfine coupling splits the levels by about 12 gigahertz microwave. In hydrogen, that's about one gigahertz, 21 centimeter line in the surrounding. Here, because relativistic effects, we have a heavy ion, a heavy atom here, the, the, the splitting's bigger. But we know that splitting to many, many digits. In fact, this is a very good atomic clock. There have been atomic clocks based on this transition here. So we know that level, that, 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 that frequency very well. And I also write down the Zeeman shift if we had a magnetic field, like when the subway goes by, if the lab were right next to you know, the, the, the 10 or 100 milligauss would cause this, this qubit's frequency to change a little bit. But it's actually not so bad. And the reason is these are Zeeman levels with m equals zero. So they have no linear Zeeman chip. They only have a quadratic Zeeman chip. And in fact, we do have a, a small field on in the experiment of a few Gauss. And so there's a residual linear shift. If you, you know, plug in b plus db here squared, you get a small linear effect. It's pretty small. So at one milligauss, that would be, that would be uh, six hertz. So, so um, that's the Hertz level there. So if you had, if, when the subway goes by, that, eight would be, that 18 would become a 24. So it's not a big deal. That's, pretty, that's a pretty small frequency shift. So as long as our experiments are faster than one second, we should be OK, even here in this lecture hall. <laughs> OK, so here's where we're going to store our quantum information, our qubit. And I will call that up and down sometimes, sometimes 0 and 1. Uh, I think it's mostly up and down here. This is our effective spin 1 half system. So we're isolating these two levels. That's our qubit. Now, the special thing about these atomic ions is that we can, with almost perfect efficiency, we can detect the state of a single quantum. And this is afforded through lasers. We know that a transition from the ground S state to the excited P state, at, again, that's only three uh, uh, digits of accuracy. I can spell that wavelength out to seven or eight or 10 digits. It's in the near UV, but when we shine laser light at that exact wavelength, um, this atom will cycle up and down between these two levels. And, and every time it does, it will, it will spontaneously emit one photon in a random direction. But we get to do this about a billion times a second. And even though we only collect a small fraction of that from our optics, our inefficiencies, our detectors aren't so great, it doesn't matter. This is data on a single atom prepared in this spin-up state. And after about one, that should be a microsecond. You can see all my <laughs> mu's became m's. In about a millisecond, we detect 10 clicks from our PMT, our photomultiplier tube, when the atom is in the state spin up. And this is a picture from the camera when a single atom is in the state spin up, it glows. We see fluorescence. 
Now, if we do the same experiment, the only difference being the atom is prepared in the other state, it's dark. It's dark because now we're 12 gigahertz away. Remember, this is the same laser here. It's 12 gigahertz away from a, from, from a transition that has a line width of 20 megahertz. So, so it's, uh, it's thousand, a few thousand uh, line widths away. So the atom is transparent to this light, and we see darkness. That's real data there. <laughs> it's dark, and there's the histogram of, of the photons we collect, pretty much zero. And the point here is that these two distributions are so different that we can set a discriminator in the middle, and with better than 99.8% or 9% efficiency, we can detect our single quantum. This is rare. You never see this in quantum mechanics. If you have a quantum system, it's, it was so well isolated from the environment, so you can have superpositions. It was so well isolated that you weren't able to look at it. And when you do get in there to look at it, you disturb the system before you can look at it. With, with, with these atomic ions, it's different. You can actually send a laser beam in there and, and then look at it with, with, with full efficiency if you want. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Keep you from dropping down the lower state? That's a Once you've excited, what keeps you from dropping down? Oh, selection rules. Selection. Yeah, angular momentum selection rules. I, I, I simplify things a little bit here, but it's, it's and most ions that are used that are useful, you turn is not the only one. They have similar selection rules like that. Okay, I need to really move on here. Um, so the interesting interaction that we will use to derive gates involves lasers that actually flip the spin coherently. So these are these are uh, afforded by laser beams that are that are that are not that are not scattering light directly. They're very far detuned from an excited state, but by applying two frequencies of the laser, we can actually um, we can coherently flip the spin. We can also do it with microwaves at 12.6 gigahertz, but it's hard to focus microwaves down in five microns, so we use lasers. And we also want to apply forces to the ions to do entangling gates, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that next. In fact, that's my next slide. So um, my title was Networking Ions. Well, there's sort of three ways that people think about networking. I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about one and a very little bit about another way. I'm not going to talk about this, this middle guy. But the obvious thing is to, 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 to exploit the Coulomb interaction. And uh, th this is an idea that was first uh, proposed by Serac and Zoller shortly after they learned about Shor's algorithm. <laughs> they said, oh, well, ions, you could actually get, uh, wire them together and make gates. The idea is, uh, imagine preparing uh, a bunch of ions in, 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 a, uh, in an ion trap, and they're laser cooled so that not only are they nearly at rest, but they're in their zero point energy of motion. They're cooled all the way to the ground state. There can be no lower level. Now, the vibration is also a quantum system. You, you might call them phonons in a, in a solid state system. We can call them phonons here, that's fine. The idea is to entangle is, let's say we want to entangle, make a controlled knot gate on any two of these. The idea is to shine lasers on one atom in particular and that laser will be what I just talked about, these, these, two, these, these two colors of light that coherently flip the spin. But not only do they flip the spin, but they, they also are tuned such that they add a phonon of motion. In chemical physics, this is called uh, Raman scattering. And we're doing that exactly here. Now, this is hard to draw. I'm trying to depict a superposition of spin uh, that was mapped to a superposition of motion. So this spin state used to be in a superposition up and down. Now it's mapped to a superposition of collective motion. And it's collective because of the Coulomb interaction. And there's a normal mode of motion. You can imagine pendulums connected by springs. This is the center mass mode. That's, that's hard to draw in a quantum way, a superposition of motion. But this is what we can do with these ions. Now the information that used to be in this qubit is shared. It's sort of a bus. And then we do a very similar pulse over here. We flip that spin if and only if there's motion. It's a very similar type of interaction. And then we undo the first step. We remap, we unmap the motion back to the spin. And in the end, what happens is that we flip that spin depending on that spin. That's what a control knot gate is. So this is how you do it. You start with a bunch of ions, you cool them to the ground state, and you try to um, you try to entangle them that way. And I can skip over a few application slides. Um, I want to now turn to um, a little bit of a different topic. It's not exactly quantum gates, but you can imagine doing this type of this type of operation globally. Now, imagine I have a bunch of ions here. They can all be they can be up or down, 
and I apply a big fat laser beam that hits all of them simultaneously, not focusing on individual ones. And you can imagine in the lab, this is a lot easier. It's easier to get a big fat beam to hit everything. Well, there's a lot of interesting physics here, and I'll, I'll, I'll sort of paint that story now. Let's imagine, and, and again, um, I, I, I don't have time to justify this too much, but these laser forces uh, are spin dependent. They can, uh, because of the selection rules, these, these, these laser beams that are detuned from the excited state act differently on the two hyperfine states. And so this is sort of a classical force, only the sign of the force depends on the, the state of the ion, up or down. So if you're in state spin up, you feel a force upward. If you're in spin down, you feel a force downward. So my question is, under the influence of this force, what is the, what is the lowest energy configuration of these, of these qubits, these spins? Um, it's a question that has an obvious answer when you think about it, like, like almost anything. But if you consider the simple cases, let's imagine, remember the question, what is the configuration that's the ground state here? If you have all spin up atoms, they will all move up together. And the Coulomb energy is the same, because they're, they're, they're separated by the same amount. If you have all spin down, they all move down together. The Coulomb interaction is the same. But if they're like this, alternating in spins, in an antiferromagnetic uh, staggered order, then they're a little further apart. Every ion is a little further apart from all the others. And the Coulomb energy is lowered. So this is actually the ground state. This is the lowest energy state under the influence of that force. Now, these are spin one half particles. There's another energy configuration that's equally the ground state, this one. So we have a generation <coughs> two. This is, a, this is sort of a, a classical antiferromagnet, but it's not classical at all. We might expect to see both of them at the same time. If it's a quantum system, depending on how we make the ground, how we arrive at the ground state, how we get there, how we cool the system, we might expect to see a superposition of these two. Okay, so this is something you never see in, in uh, real magnetism because, and again, I'm probably gonna uh, slight some people in this room, but that's okay. In real magnets, when you have like a North Pole and a South Pole, um, you might ask, well, why is the North up and the South down? Well, how come, how do they decide? Well, we say in kinetic matter physics that, uh, that something happened called spontaneous symmetry breaking which I think is a bunch of BS. It, it means that you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what happened. It's an okay concept, but there's no physics behind it. It means that you, you, this system arranged itself according to the Earth's field, or it arranged itself according to a defect that propagated. But in quantum mechanics, we don't have spontaneous symmetry breaking. And this is a sufficiently small quantum system where we might expect a lack of symmetry breaking, and we might expect magnets that are both south up and south down at the same time. Why not? If they're both degenerate, those states, there's nothing that would break that symmetry, okay? So we can see this in our laboratory with this really tiny magnet, okay? So I mentioned, how do you get to the ground state when you have this force on? Because you'll see this operator doesn't flip spins. If you create a certain set of spins in a certain state and you apply this force, you remain there forever. We need to somehow mix things up, and for that reason, we add a transverse field in this classic physics system called the transverse icing model. The, trans the transverse field allows the spins to precess. And so what's going to be important here is the ratio of the field to the force. When the field is really big, the, the spins will all anti-align with the field. That's the ground state. That's called paramagnetism. It's the, they're polarized according to the field. When the field is small compared to F, then they form order. There's, there can be entanglement in this case. They form order depending on the schedule of this force, on the interaction. So the transverse field icing model, is, from my understanding, is the simplest model in physics that admits a phase transition, a quantum phase transition at zero temperature. And so this is a great place to start if you want to study phase transitions in the quantum realm. This is not really a quantum computer, but it has all the features that we want for gates. Instead, we're doing what's called a quantum simulation. We're simulating a very well-known physics model that might get hard to calculate if you make the system complex enough. Okay, this next slide is going to be nasty, and I apologize, I'll make it brief. We don't apply forces this way because they're much too weak. These are sort of static forces. If you imagine you want to get your kid going on a swing set, you're not just going to gently nudge them and hold them there, right? You're going to push them on resonance, and then, uh, then they, they get to go with high amplitudes. Well, we have lots of resonances here. We have normal modes. 
So in fact, in the laboratory, we apply laser beams that are crisscrossed in such a way with beat notes in, in, uh, in such a configuration that we end up with sort of a walking standing wave that is near one of the resonances of motion. And in that way, we get a spin-dependent force that couples resonant, near resonantly to these motional modes. And um, we're also flipping spins at the same time. This is sort of a technical detail. But um, in, in, the, in, the, um, in the rest frame of the atom, which is moving harmonically, the, atom, the lasers acquire sidebands uh, in the spectrum. So we see motional sidebands at all the different motional modes of these ions. For 10, for ten ions, there will be 10 modes of motion. And we tune our laser to hit near the upper and lower sidebands. And again, I, I, don't, I don't have time to get into this. It might not be unreasonable, though, that by doing this and eliminating the phonons that were, as long as we're far enough tuned from these sidebands, we end up with a spin-spin interaction written this way. This is an icing interaction. It's sort of like having two bar magnets in one dimension um, that, that interact that way. And we have a coupling matrix between the spins. Now, the important thing about the system is that this is not a nearest neighbor icing interaction. This is a fully connected icing interaction. Every ion, every spin interacts with every other spin because the normal modes are non-local. The normal modes are shared amongst all of them. Okay? And what's neat about this, uh, this system is that we can have control over that matrix. I'll talk about that in a minute. We also apply another laser beam, beat note, uh, right near the spin flip. It, it's phase shifted, so this is the transverse field. It's not a real field. It's, it's, a, it's a spin flip along a different direction. And what, uh, what I wanted to say is that these icing couplings, uh, there's some constants in front laser powers. This thing in brackets is called the recoil frequency. It has to do with the amount of momentum transfer. It scales the force that you can apply. This sum is over all the normal modes, and, it, and we have our tuning of the laser with respect to the normal modes. This is a Lorentzian. When you drive a harmonic oscillator off resonance, you get a Lorentzian response. It's all in there. But by simply tuning the laser, we can sort of control global features of this interaction. Making it short range or long. Yes, exactly. So, so we, can, we can, with good, good approximation, write the icing coupling as a power law with distance. And we can vary that power law, exponent, just with a knob, a laser knob, a nice quiet laser knob. From, in principle, from zero to three. It can, it can be infinite range, it can be dipolar, one of our cube. So you don't have that solid state, you don't have a knob to dial in the range. And so that's kind of an interesting thing to do. So, here. how many atoms would you say you can at maximum number of atoms? Uh, right now, we're playing with about 20. So, two to the 20th is only a million. So, even I can diagonalize a million by million density matrix. It's not easy, but uh, even I could. I mean, if you get to 30 or 40, forget it. Um, so we're on the cusp of something that you can't check. And how, how stable are these systems? How long do they last? Uh, all good because questions. Want, like, how long are they going to well, we can store one ion in the trap for three months. Uh, with 20 ions, it turns out there's something we don't understand. It has to do with the background gas. It's not zero. Pressure is never zero. It's really small. It's not zero. And, and any collision with the background gas will melt the crystal which is not deadly, you can get it back, but not always, and we don't understand that process. And the more ions you have, the more likely any one of them will feel a collision. And so with 20 ions, the lifetime is about five minutes. We can, we can take more data, but, but it turns out that it takes, it takes about 15 minutes to, for things to relax so we can take data. So if we're waiting five, we only have five minutes, so we have to wait 15 minutes, we don't get data too fast. So that's what we're going to do by now. Now in the future, we're going to go to a chamber that's at four Kelvin, and that will totally erase this problem. The pressure will go down by three orders of magnitude. And so we should be able to go to a few hundred. We know how to do that. We have enough power to do that. OK, so very, very briefly, I, I need to kind of speed it up here. The transverse field icing model, and we're following sort of a prescription of how you do a quantum simulation. This is the, the so-called adiabatic model of quantum simulation. And the idea is to start your spins in the ground state of something trivial, in this case, we we'll polarize it or polarize them against the magnetic field. And then we lower adiabatically, hopefully, we lower the magnetic field compared to these J's. And then if we were adiabatic, we should evolve to the ground state of this more interesting Hamiltonian. Now, how do you know you're adiabatic? Well, you need to know the energy spectrum, you need to know what the gaps are and so forth. It's a circular problem. If the system is too complicated, you can't calculate it, you don't know you're adiabatic. And so there's a little bit of an issue here. But uh, let, let me just let me just go through some of the data. And, kind of uh, 
include on your own how interesting this is. Well, okay, here's real data on 10 spins, 10 ions. Uh, there they are all in the state spin up. Here they are all in the state spin down. I promise you there's data in there. They're just dark. Now, we do, it, we do an experiment 2,600 times, and this experiment is to polarize them along a transverse field, adiabatically relax that transverse field, and then take a picture. What are the spin states? 2,600 times. Well, about 20% of the time, we see one of these two states. In fact, if you look at the statistics, uh, it's about 8 or 9% each. Okay. What happened to the other 80%? Well, we weren't adiabatic. We, our ramp was too fast, we didn't, you know, the gap is pretty small here. You know, the gap of an antiferromagnetic system with long range couplings is really small. This system is highly frustrating. If you flip just one of these spins, things are, it doesn't take too much energy. Of course, the nearest neighbors are very upset. But the next nearest neighbors are happy. They're more happy. And if you have a long range interaction, it doesn't take very much energy at all to flip one spin. So the gaps are really small. Being adiabatic is hard. So here's 70 percent of the data. Here, these four, this quartet is another two percent of the data. And here you see we have a domain wall. We have a defect. Um, again, one of the spins is flipped. These two are not happy. They, that costs energy. But, but again, if you average over the entire string, that's not much of an energy gap there. The next one percent are these quartets where we have we have domain walls toward the edge there. Now, the reason these four have a different energy than these four is that we don't have uh, we have an anisotropy across the string. Turns out it takes more energy to flip spins on the outside. Okay. Now we can do better than that. We can plot the distribution of all 1024 spin states. We have all measurements here. We measure every spin. So we can measure any correlation function you want. Here's the paramagnetic state. They should all be uh, up plus down to the 10th power. So that means that we should have, uh, we should have uh, pretty much every state occupied with 0.1%. That's largely what we see. There's some detection errors here. And here's the data after we uh, try to compare the ground state. And these are ordered according to just binary numbers. Uh, so, so this is all up. This is all down. And these are the two states that are the nominal ground states. You see lots of other stuff, though, going on. And this is dynamics of the other levels. And in fact, if you order these according to energy, because it's only a 10 spin system, we can, we can actually calculate the energy of the system exactly. Um, with, with 40 spins, it's kind of hard to do that, but with, with 10, we can. And if we order them according to energy, we see this very interesting curve. We see the ground states, again, um, take, take about 20%, and we see almost kind of an exponential decay of energy here. Exponential? There's no, there's no temperature here. It's almost like a Boltzmann factor is acting, but there's, there's, no, there's no temperature. So, so this, is, this is a system that looks like it's almost thermalizing, in a way. But there's very complicated dynamics going on here between the system, between these spins. And this is something, these dynamics are really hard to calculate, even for 10 spins. This is data for two different ranges of the interaction, by the way. The, the longer range interaction in blue has a smaller gap between ground and first excited state and so forth. Again, I'll show you more time to talk about that data. Um, again, I need to start wrapping up. Um, now, okay, so, so, so I sort of went into a foray of quantum simulation, which is one very physics uh, 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 direction of quantum computing, and it's very relevant because the experiments are starting to do interesting things, and they're they're they're, they're coming from physics. But all the tools we use for quantum simulation are exactly those needed to do gates and to do algorithms. But why bother why bother factoring 21? We already know the answer. So so it's, I'm I'm kind of happy it's returned to physics for now, and I think I think later on it will evolve back into computer science as we make the system bigger. Well, how do we make the system bigger? There, there are a few ways with these ions to, to step beyond 20 spins. One of them has, uh, has, building, uh, has us building very complicated traps with many electrodes where we actually have zones where we only entangle a few spins, uh, maybe 20, maybe 10, maybe we can get to 100 or something. We're not going to entangle a million in one chain. That's just too big, too many, too many uh, normal modes. It's going to be, it's going to be too slow. Uh, you know, big systems are slow. <laughs> But we could entangle three or five, and then when we're done entangling, we can actually physically move them. We can pick up an ion and pull it around and bring it in contact with another ion in this very complex chip that looks a lot like CMOS. I mean, you're gonna, you're gonna have to take advantage of some, some of the fabrication facilities to do this. Um, in fact, uh, Dave Weiland, uh, Dave Popinski, and I, many years ago, proposed this idea of scaling. 
sort of a modular way of having different nodes to do computations locally. And we're not ready for this yet, mainly because the chip traps, the, I, the ion traps aren't, the ones we used so far, the one I showed you at the beginning was sort of made by hand. They're starting to get more professional, but these still don't work quite yet. This is from Sandia National Laboratory that has a big ion trap group that we work with them as many others do. We actually uh, built the first monolithic trap out of gallium arsenide, which is terrible. It was an awful behaving trap. But these are beautiful electrodes. They're, they're made through you know, MEMS, gallium arsenide, and LGAS technologies. Georgia Tech has a big foundry doing this as well. Dave Weinler's group at NIST Boulder uh, are also making traps. This is gold on aluminum. But this technology is coming. And it's maybe not ready now, but five or 10 years, we're all going to be using these things. So this, this, this trap here, the ions actually float above the surface of this silicon chip that has a bunch of aluminum electrodes plated on it. Anyway. So, so you're moving the ions around like a vanadium tank? Is that yeah, yeah, the there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. Uh, again, the, 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 the qubits are stored in the magnetic dipoles. They're moving around based on their electric monopole. So as long as, you know, as, long as, as, as monopoles and magnetic dipoles are separate, as far as we know they are, up to relativistic effects. Um, we should be okay. In fact, this has been done. I would say Dave Weiland's group has done the most in this area. But they have shuttled and verified and technical persists. It's not really a surprise. What's exotic is that these ion traps, I mean, these are single atoms. And you're, not, you're just not used to that, dealing with single atoms, moving them around without messing them up. I want to talk just, just for a few minutes about another way to make connections, and this involves photons. Totally different than, than, than the Coulomb uh, photons I talked about before. Okay, you'll recognize these energy levels by now. This is our neutrobium ion. Um, so, so the idea here is that we're going to, uh, instead of uh, instead of creating superpositions of our qubit state, we're going to we're going to make photons by uh, promoting this atom, say, from that state, that definite state, to this state. Now, this state can decay. It can decay back to where it started, but that has a different polarization than these two decay channels. And if we select that polarization, and throw it away. Let's only consider the case where we get uh, circularly polarized light, either plus or minus. And due to angular momentum conservation, the atom will be correlated with the polarization of the photon after the decay. So I write this state here. I, I write H and V, but we can, we can always transform circular right and left to H and V. Um, so we end up with this entangled state between the, the qubit. Oh, there's a technical thing here. Once, a, a, after we emit the photon, we want to go back into these clock states that are nice field insensitive. So we zap it with three microwave pulses. And those are very clean, four nines in accuracy. That's easy to do. Now, we have a nice system. We have a nice qubit in the atom uh, that's correlated and tangled with this photon, the polarization of that photon. And the price we pay is that this isn't always right. In fact, it's almost never right. We only get this state about 0.3% of the time. The other 99.7% of the time, this photon hit the wall. It went the other way, or it had the wrong polarization. So we're not collecting light very efficiently. And we have to actually get it through a fiber, and we have losses, and so forth. So, and, and we have to detect it in the end. I, I haven't shown that yet. But when you put all those inefficiencies in there, we have 3, 10 to the minus 3. So this is sort of post-selected. And by itself, it's not very useful. Why would you do this? Well, you would do this because we're going to do it twice. We're going to do it with this atom here, and we're going to do it with this atom there. And so now we're going to generate single photons from two separate atoms, and we have to get lucky twice. So that means the probability is 10 to the minus 5 instead of 3 10 to the minus 3. Yeah, 10 to the minus 5. Um, so one out of 100,000 tries, we actually get two photons into the fiber. And we have that in, uh, in, uh, a mode match on a beam split, a plain old half silver mirror, 50-50, non-polarizing beam square. And there's a neat quantum effect that goes on here. And it turns out that if you take two photons, exactly two photons, on a beam splitter, and you mode match them perfectly, and they have the same color, same polarization, and everything, they're identical, uh, what happens is they will either both go that way or both go that way. You will never see them go independent ways. There's an interference, a destructive interference between going through the beam splitter and reflecting off the beam splitter. That's a pure quantum effect. It's called the hamu mandel effect. Uh, and if you look at the, the quantum physics of two photons on a beam splitter, it's sort of obvious like everything. But, uh, uh, so what we're going to do in this experiment is send these two photons on a beam splitter and wait for our two detectors to click. Well, I just 
told you they never click together. You never get two photons going in opposite direction. That's true if the photons are identical, but these photons can come in two flavors, H and V. So when the two detectors click, we know that it either must be H1V2 or V1H2. And in fact, the, the beam splitter erases, you, you can never know which atom emitted which polarization. And so when the two detectors click, the atoms become entangled. Bang, just like that. It's almost like magic. And this is useful. This entanglement now, you can use it. You can propagate it. It's very slow. We have to wait. We, we can do the experiment at about a megahertz, probably success 10 minus 5. So we can do this at about 10 hertz, which is really slow, unfortunately. But it's a nice resource. These atoms can be really far apart. It allows us to network entanglement over, over large distances. And we've, done, we've used this to do something. For instance, we've done many things. One, one, one of the experiments, we call it quantum teleportation. We didn't call it that. Charlie Bennett called it that. Quantum teleportation is the conveyance of quantum information over a remote distance. It's pretty much what it is. And it turns out when you convey quantum information over a remote distance, you can do it without any real wires at the time of transformation. You can do it without any physical interactions at the time of transmission. It requires that you have entanglement, sort of like EPR, spooky action at a distance. You have these two atoms. In this case, we have two separate chambers separated by about a meter. We upload a quantum bit in this atom. This one is prepared in a standard state. And we entangle them. We try to entangle them. And after a tenth of a second, we actually get them entangled. And once they're entangled, we then, uh, again, I'm going pretty fast here, we measure this atom in a different basis. Of course, if we were to measure uh, the first atom in, in the up-down basis, we'd be done. Alpha and beta would be gone. And the whole point here is to move alpha and beta from here to there without looking at it. So we have alpha and beta shared. We measure the first spin in a transverse basis. And based on that measurement, we do something to the second spin. And then alpha and beta will be recovered over here. It looks like magic. It's called teleportation because we moved that unknown quantum superposition from there to there without that superposition ever really making the trip. Yeah. So when you measure the one on the left, you get some classical information, yeah. right? And yeah. you use that classical information to do a transformation of, yes. the, of the atom on the right. Yep. And then that completes the... Yes. So there's no faster than light communication right. here. Okay. You, have to, you have to do a classical phone call and say, oh, I, I, I measured this state, so you should flip that atom one way. No, I measured this state, you should flip the atom. If you don't do this step, then this is just noise. So that's the trick. It's called, I've, I've, I've actually caught myself telling people that we've teleported an atom from here to there. <clears throat> and people laugh at me and call me a crackpot. Well, these atoms are identical. They're the same isotope of the same species. The only thing that separates these atoms is their state. And for us, their state means one of two levels. And so you can never devise an experiment that could tell the difference whether I had actually moved that atom itself over here or I did this protocol. So why not call it, why not call it teleporting an atom? Yeah. So when Hans Daimel had a positron trapped for six months, how do you know it was the same positron? Uh, it's the same state. <laughs> it's a field, right? Are you going to say that this atom is only an excitation in the field? Yeah, anyway, uh, no, so I, you know, I, I don't like to say that we teleported a single atom. It's kind of jargon. It's, it's hype. You know, this is information transfer. Let's leave it at that. And it's very useful. If you want to build a quantum computer, you're going to be doing teleportation. You're going to be moving information this way. Yeah. And your atoms are boson, right? Uh, 171 is a... Your ion, sorry. The ion. Let me think now. Um, yes, it is a boson. It doesn't matter. They don't overlap. They're five microns apart. Right. But I mean, there's some... And so it doesn't. There's no exchange anti-symmetry. Well, like these are one meter apart. So it's e to the minus one meter over over ten nanometers. The exchange integral is just so small that you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, I, you think of them as Boltzmann ions. I mean, ions don't. You can't get them close enough so that statistics plays a role. Okay. So all right. So so you, you probably gather that this photonic link is going to be the bottleneck here. So if you want to, I'm always asked, so why don't we be able to teleport a fly or a person? Well, not only do you have to make the system really complicated to have, have not, not just two to the 300 states, but two to the two to the 30th states, because I'm made up of, I don't know, two to the 27 atoms or something like that. So there's way too much information, and think about it, 10 hertz per qubit. 
2 to the 2 to the 27. Okay, so a lot, lots of time needed. So that's kind of silly. But we think of this teleportation protocol as a way to make a modular quantum computer. Now you can sort of now have the background for exactly what this architecture is. Here in these red boxes, we have maybe 100 ions. And we're done. With 100, we maybe have good control of them. We can do 20 now. I think we'll be able to do 100 pretty soon, 50 or 100. Now we have to give up with more than 100. So we use one of those ions to launch a photon. And maybe one of these ions launches a photon. This technology exists. This is a MEMS optical cross-connect switch. It's, there's, there's one of those in the display here. Um, this is well known. Uh, it's like an, a telephone operator. Every input fiber can be coupled to any, any output fiber. These are integrated fiber beam splitters. So you can kind of see these two photons. Depending on the configuration of that switch, we're going to look for the CCD camera to give two clicks here, depending on how we uh, 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 configure the switch to, to generate entanglement between that and that. It's very slow right now. I think maybe there's lots of engineering that will allow that interface to be much faster. You know, right now we're at University Lab, but apply engineering to this problem, I think things will uh, kind of get dramatically better. So let me, let me sort of conclude by going back to our friend Tom Clancy, and I hope I gave you a taste of, you know, we're just scratching the surface here. And there are so many smart people out there coming to this field. New ideas are coming, and, and again, this other book, um, Clancy points out that his hero here actually did build a quantum computer. He was just talking about it. He built one. And he's asked, how did you do it if everybody else failed? And he said, well, I'm smarter than they are. <laughs> and, and this is the cool thing about this field. There are so many smart people from computer science, information theory, mathematics, physics, chemistry getting into this field. And you know, I think that it's a matter of turning this type of a hardware into something that's fully quantum. And while I talked about individual atoms, these are very sort of at the very bottom and building up. You can start at the very top and try to build down. This is a depiction of a, a, a defect in, in, a, a, in, in, in a, a, a crystal, like nitrogen vacancies in diamond. That's a popular one. Single phosphorus donors in silicon. Um, these are superconducting. Uh, sorry, these are superconducting squids. Um, there are many groups that are that are that are storing qubits in flux states of, of Josephson junctions. These are charged. Um, uh, 2D electron gases that are, you can call them gated quantum dots, optical quantum dots, there's all kinds of it, atomic physics, optical lattices, photons, cavity QED, uh, 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 control, ultra-fast controlled molecules. There's all kinds of technology out there. It's really fun. You have, I'm having, I'm at the very bottom here, but learning about all these fields is amazing. It, it, makes, it makes the field uh, just wonderful. Now, I would say, um, I don't know if anybody here reads Time Magazine, this week, this is this week's, it's, 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 it's just amazing. Um, the cover of Time Magazine is sort of a, a little embarrassing. Um, there's a company in Canada called D-Wave, and this is uh, from their website. They've already done it. They have the quantum computer. They're a bunch of charlatans. It's amazing they're getting away with this. It really, it's truly amazing. They have a bunch of bar magnets that, that they're Joseph's injunctions, but they're deeply in the classical realm. They're not qubits. They can't even show qubit behavior. They can't show perfect measurement, anything like that. But they wired together a bunch of, a bunch of Joseph's injunctions, nice engineering, nothing to do with quantum mechanics. And they're playing games here with quantum mechanics because, as we know, everything is quantum mechanical. I am quantum mechanical. So they put together a system that looks like a quantum computer, and they call it a quantum computer, and they have lots of funding from venture capital firms. So I. Uh, I, I would never recommend anybody read Time Magazine, but you might want to read this one. It's just interesting how, uh, I mean, it's very unscientific. They rarely publish, and when they do, it's really obscure stuff. Um, so this company is D-Wave, and uh, it's, it's really embarrassing for the field, so I would say, you know, stay away from it. <laughs> what I worry about is that when they fall, not if, when they fall, we want to make sure they don't take the rest of the field down with them. Um, and and that, that's a real concern at this point. And, and, uh, so uh, if you haven't read about D-Wave, get involved. I, I made my own version of the, of the Time Magazine cover. It's more like it should be an ad magazine. <laughs> These guys are real bozos. It's a real press machine. So on that, on that uh, interesting, dramatic, and fun note, let me, <laughs> let me back away and reproduce my first slide. And, and, and the point here that, that this, this new field of quantum information science is not just physics. It starts in physics. And I were doing quantum simulations that are really from the ingrained physics and, and math side, but it really is a conglomeration of all kinds of different fields, which makes it very exciting. And of course, we're all studying the 
the age-old question of what happens when you make a quantum system big. Um, and, and this is, of course, codified in Schrodinger's cat paper in 1935. Is there a limit to how big of a quantum system we can make? These are wonderful physics questions. And at the same time, maybe we can make some new technology. So with that, um, thanks for your uh, attention. Take any questions. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk, Taika. Well, I know that people oh, quite a while ago, like Claudia Tesci, were trying to work on making superpositions in uh, DC squids or something? A superposition of flux states yeah. in a DC squid. I don't know what has happened to that kind of stuff over the years. Yeah, there are more RF squids now, but th there are wonderful, there's wonderful work at Yale, Santa Barbara, I'd say they're the leaders. Um, they're doing beautiful work that are realizing qubits out of Joseph's injunction, these, these, these squids. Um, you have to make them in such a way um, they're, they're very small, um, and they, I think they've wired together maybe five or ten of them so far. It's very similar to what we are, where we are with these ions. Uh, beautiful work. So they're like a superposition of a of, of yeah, the of left flux right. that's yeah, going yeah. through the loop. Like right. plus yeah. one flux on or minus one or yeah. plus one half minus one half. Yeah. Um, so I don't mean to I don't mean to poo poo the idea of superconducting junctions. They're wonderful uh, uh, ideas. In fact, up the up the river at IBM is one of the biggest groups that's engineering the stuff from the bottom. I mean, they're legitimate. D-Wave has unfortunately taken the system and, and just supplied you know, from the top down. They, have, they just wire together 500 and decree that these are quantum bits. You, you, you really have to, to say something is quantum and relevant to quantum information, you have to be able to look at the individual parts in a way that you, that, that you can violate a Bell inequality would be the technical term. Um, and no, it's, 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 I would say, next to the trapped ions, Superconducting junctions are, are one of the top contenders, really, right now. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to. Uh, Matt, yeah. Can, can you generate terms in the Hamiltonian that couple three spins or three atoms rather than two? So yeah, three body interactions? Yeah, the three emphasizing model terms. Yeah. The reason I ask is that, as I'm sure you know, there's this three satisfiability problem. Which yeah. Is that the yeah. If you could generate terms like that. The so th three body interactions, there, there are proposals to do that. In fact, uh, uh, Reiner Blotz group at Innsbruck, who works with trapped ions, as I do, um, the, the way they generated three-body interactions, and I think they went all the way up to six-body interactions, they did it by uh, discretizing their gates. So, so, so this is called a Trotter expansion. If you, if you take a three-body interaction, you can expand it as a sum of two-body interactions, but when you rapidly go from all possible two-body interactions in a time much faster than the, than the overall strength of the three-body interaction, um, you can ignore all the commutator terms. Uh, they're very small, they're higher order, and, and you get, a, 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 it's called the Trotter expansion, you can realize it that way. It requires that you have exquisite control of these gates and you synchronously <coughs> climb to all pairs. Um, but you know, that, that, that's, that's hard to do in a way. It involves gates that, that you, know, you, have to, you have to individually hit every pair. Whereas we're applying these global interactions that, that's a little harder to do. But it certainly is possible. And yeah, I'm aware of these three sat and, and other problems that, that look, look to be very interesting, even with regard to this adiabatic uh, type quantum computing. Maybe the ground state of some Hamiltonian corresponds to the solution of some three set. But I guess the Hamiltonian in that case is an any body interaction. The Hamiltonian is, yeah, involves three, three spin interactions. And if you do it with this very rapid switches, that sounds a bit dangerous. Right, errors will accumulate. Yeah. You have to. You may have to do error correction on that. On that. So yeah. So just, just a very simple question. Uh, why do you have this uh, ions in a line instead of in a circle for the boundary effects? Oh yeah, a good point. Um, only for uh, convenience to start with. If we only have a few ions, a line is sort of the obvious. Now it turns out to make a two-dimensional uh, crystal is really hard due to a technical thing. Uh, so these ions are held with radio frequency fields, um, and we have uh, the line is exactly where the null of the RF fields are. If you if you go to two dimensions, then the ions will actually they have a wiggle motion, a driven wiggle motion. But there are if you, if you need a big ring, uh, in fact Sandia right now is they have a ring trap. It's, it's uh, I think it's about a millimeter across, and they can hold 300 ions around a line. And they've done this out of silicon. It's beautiful. In a circle. Yeah, in a circle. So now they're uniformly spaced. You have more symmetry there. But in practice, there's always little puddles of, in, uh, of, of you know, some defect. So you know, uh, they haven't perfected it yet. But you know, that, that's, that's a, a, a very interesting geometry. Uh, to
to the ring in particular. But 2D and 3D crystals, other than that ring, um, look, look to be really hard. Yeah, yeah, ring is great. Yeah. Thanks. So one of the points you made is that it's quite a bit easier to build a system which will function as a simulation of a some given Hamiltonian that you wouldn't be able to simulate with a classical computer. You said 40, if you, if you scaled up to 40, you couldn't do it. Uh, by a classical computer, uh, or, or there's some number, and that is actually not that hard to do as a simulator. On the other hand, uh, a, a computer is, uh, is, is more complicated than simply a simulator. So my question is, how big a system would you have to build you also said you, you don't want to uh, factor 21. How big a, a, a system would you have to build to factor an interesting one? OK, so the break RSA. Yes, so that's a complicated question. The reason is it depends on the level of error. Because that, and one thing I didn't talk about at all, it's very important, it's called error correction. Right. Very much like classic, you remember the old Memory chips had parity bits. You don't need those anymore because errors are so rare. But even 20 years ago, uh, there was an extra pin on your memory chip that was a parity check. It's a little bit of a redundant encoding to correct for errors, or at least detect errors. <coughs> now, this is going to be crucial in quantum computing. So we're going to have to use extra qubits just for redundant encoding. It turns out you need to entangle them. And then you can recover from errors. Now, the overheads are severe. So if you have an error level that is 10 to the minus 8, then you're actually in pretty good shape. But if your error level is only 10 to the minus 5, you might need an overhead of 10 to the 5. You might need 10 to the 5 qubits for one qubit. Uh, again, this is, my, this, is, this is research that's ongoing. So I, I would have to add to that um, what, what the error level is. So let me give you an example, though. These are a little, little off the cuff here. But if I wanted to factor an interesting number, let's say it has 200 digits. There's, let's say 1,000 bits. That's about 300 digits or so, 1,000 bits. If you want to factor that number, I think you need about, you need something like a million qubits, maybe a billion qubits, 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 qubits. Um, and you're probably going to need about 10 to the 12 operations. <laughs> um, these numbers are just huge. And that assumes an error level of about 10 to the minus 5 or something. And so, you know, these are, these are way off from what we're doing now. So you, you were talking as if uh, quantum computing was, if not around the corner, at least something that the young people here would see. But it's not obvious. No. It's speculative. It's still speculative. It's still very speculative. Um, yeah. You, you, know, you know the famous quote, there's a Yogi Berra, prediction about the future. Is, uh, <laughs> prediction is hard, especially about the future. <laughs> it's, it's certainly in this area. I mean, go back, go back 30 years and try to imagine the iPhone. It's just hard to say what's going to happen. I think these things happen in, in, in huge, huge leaps all at once. And, and so right now, I think the interesting thing will be doing something in physics that we can't calculate. Right. Uh, well, that might, that. Maybe that will guide the development of new materials, new magnetic materials even, some of the things like the Andy's working on. Maybe we can design well, I, I, systems I that, that don't have a place in the natural world, like interactions that grow with distance. We actually can do that in this system. Interactions that grow with distance. Uh, and maybe we can realize new types of phases of this matter. I, I, so there is confined in physics. The computer side of things, I would agree with you. One-to-one um, -one functions don't look so easy here, right? One-to-one -one functions are those that have all that randomness. Um, so we need to maybe have new, a, a new set of algorithms that a quantum computer could, could tackle. There are a list of them, some of them like solving linear uh, systems of linear equations with some caveats on, on the spectrum of eigenvalues. There's a searching uncertain databases. That's a very well-known one. And this, the analogy there is if you remembered somebody's phone number, but forgot their, you forgot their name, and you have a phone book. You have to look through the entire phone book. But if you had a quantum database where it correlates name and number, but, and you forgot their name that was alphabetized, you only have to look at the square root of n entries instead of n entries. Um, that's not exponential speed up, but that's a very well-known algorithm. 
and there are many others that are that are they're they're, they're all kind of esoteric. But I, I would agree with you that that nothing is assured here. Um, yeah, we're kind of at that level. Uh, the Innsbruck group is really going after that one. Back there. I don't know if it's 21 or 15. Or I thought 15 was back there. It just was, was done by NMR, I think. Oh, yeah, but it was cheating a little bit. They simplified their circuit because they knew the answer. <laughs> <laughs> and they simplified it enough so they, they had to figure out the answer. What's that? How did they figure out the answer? <laughs> Went home and did homework problems. We better stop there. We have a reception upstairs with some wine and cheese. Let's thanks Chris again. For <laughs>